This video is brought to you by SquareX, more on that later. Ladies and gentlemen, ghosts and goblins, it's true. I've fallen in love with blue teaming. <laughs> okay, listen, listen. I know it's high treason and blasphemy to say that since we're all about offensive security here, but you know what? I'm tired of all of this pretending. This shit reversing some mal, as I call it. Yeah, me and it are like this. It's so insanely cool. Not only do you feel like an actual detective, but you feel like an actual fucking detective. There's only one thing better than analyzing malware. It's developing it. You know what's better than losing your mind trying to develop malware? Literally anything else you can possibly name. I, I mean, analyzing it. You see, what I've just described here is one of the fundamental laws of the universe. Newton's law of universal gravitation? Kepler? W what the hell is that even? Thermodynamics? I hardly think so. Two faces on the same coin flipping across the fabric of space and time in Eternum. Now that's inspiring. I've decided that we need to sing the praises of our blue teaming brothers and sisters for once and delve a bit deeper into their world, introducing our brand new malware analysis series. Please excuse my voice. I feel like I'm being beaten up underwater. As this is the premiere of a new series, allow me to lay out the lore of what we're going to be covering by the end of this series. And looking at my impeccable track record, that's assuming we actually ever reached the end. We will start by understanding the when, what, how, and why of malware analysis. We'll look at the taxonomy of malware and how it's classified, grouped, along with the families, and some of the stupidly frightening numbers that will put a lot of things into perspective. We'll come to understand the steps or methodology of this discipline. We will partly set up our own analysis dungeon, which will allow us to examine various malware samples in a safe, contained, and revertible environment. We will do a deep dive in the PE file format with the different sections in it, including the import address table. Finally, we'll do a very rudimentary analysis of some of the malware that we've programmed before from our malware development series to close out the video. And in the next couple of videos, we will explore more techniques, tools, and procedures and start spending a video at a time really going in depth, grabbing real malware samples from out there and analyzing or reversing them to understand what they do. I hope you're as excited as I am. I just want to say that, yes, I am not a malware analyst, nor am I claiming to be one. I can just about figure out how to breathe for fuck's sake, and even then, I almost die half the time. I'm just someone with an interest in the field, and I'm making this video as a way to consolidate my learning of the discipline by attempting to teach it to you guys, like I've always done on this channel. There are much better resources out there to learn malware analysis, many of whom I've taken a lot of inspiration from, and I will link them in the description, some paid, some free, something for everyone. Credit where credit is due, these are the shoulders of the giants atop which I stand. Well said, standing hurts too much right now. Do you know what hurts even more than visceral impromptu flus that could bed rid a literal deity? It's getting infected with another kind of sickness. That's right, getting attacked while surfing the internet, which is why it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the sponsor of today's video and a new friend of the channel, SquareX. SquareX gives you the ability to browse the internet fearlessly by providing you a completely secured, unrestricted, completely anonymous, and sandbox browsing experience. And it does this by giving you a disposable browser, a burner browser with a built-in VPN so you can browse from anywhere. And the best part about it, it's completely free. You can just download it as an extension completely for free. You can install it right now with a single click. If your browser isn't supported, you can just use a dedicated web app for it as well. You could use the web application, but by far the best way to access all of its rich features is by getting it from the Chrome store as an extension. The web app is great, but it doesn't currently have all the features that the extension does. All you have to do is sign up and once you've verified you are ready to use this thing if you come across a link or a file that you're not sure you should be clicking because it could be dangerous you can just right click on it open it in a brand new completely sandbox browser that is so insanely useful for not only security researchers who need to dive deeper to assess security threats but it's incredibly useful for anyone to completely protect themselves and satisfy their curiosity in the same step browser is fast as f as well because it runs on their high-speed data centers you don't believe me check this out That sh is faster than my literal internet speed. Consider the following scenario. You're part of a company, maybe you've been here for a while or maybe you're brand new and you get an email claiming to be from your boss. Now the boss says you f***ed up. Oh, and you f***ed up bad. A matter of fact, you messed up so badly that I need you to click this ASAP. And so you do, because you don't want to get fired. Unbeknownst to you, 
what you had just clicked on was in fact malware. But you couldn't have known that. Google will just tell you that it was scanned by Gmail, but it won't tell you that it was actually found to be malicious and you just got fished. But no longer is that the case because Square X incorporates itself so seamlessly. It will now tell you and scan these malicious documents and let you know if it is in fact malicious. And you can get more information. Not only that, but say you actually do want to see what's in the files, you can just open it in a sandbox environment and it's some data that you actually want to keep. You can try to let Square X just strip it of this maliciousness for you. There's even a disposable email service here, which makes things super simple. You'll have these temporary emails that will just be thrown away after. If you choose to regenerate, these sessions will automatically close and there'll be no trace. It'll delete everything. And you can extend these sessions as well if you'd like. This disposable browser is so much safer than just antivirus because anything that you open in the disposable browser will not affect your device or computer. It's all sandbox. And if you have any more questions, you can always get in contact with the Square X team who will always be happy to help you out and answer any questions that you might have. Square X was created by the legend who brought us Pentester Academy. That's right. You know, the platform that used to serve the CRTP certification, CRTE, all that stuff. Yeah, fangirling pretty hard. Absolute legend, and you can tell that this is a very incredible platform. And it's got great reviews across the board. You can find the referral link to sign up in the description or the pinned comment below. Thank you so much to SquareX for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to the video. Well, why malware analysis? It's long been said that for evil to exist, it follows that a necessary good must also exist. As malware analysts, we're the light to the malware developers dark, the Batman to their Joker, the Vim to their Emacs. All this is to say that in order to analyze malware, we need malware. Furthermore, as long as there's an incentive to exploit something, which as we'll see, there always will be, whether it's money, information, curiosity, or just for gits and shiggles, or whatever. Ever. Malware will always be there as technology becomes more and more advanced, accessible, and flexible. New techniques will be uncovered all the time, or it will make it easier for people, novices, and advanced alike to create malware that can have a very serious impact on devices or users, like they have been since the beginning of time. So both sides have their work cut out for them. In finality, Jerry equals malware development, Tom equals malware analysis. Whether you choose one discipline or the other, it's undeniable that knowing the TTPs of the other side can make you much better at your own role. And that's great and all, but we still haven't gone to what malware analysis truly is. What malware analysis is, is a systematic approach towards identifying malware, what the malware has done, any damages it's potentially caused, how it even got into the machine on the first place, among a little bit of other things. But the main thing is responding to an incident. However, malware analysis can also be used for things like malware researching. It could be used for threat hunting, for incident responses. The biggest objective of malware analysis is fundamentally to understand the malware and what it's capable of doing. But there's also other objectives as well, little side quests. We can figure out how the malware is communicating with the attacker to see if we we can investigate that lead towards figuring out who or where the attacker is. The coolest thing is once we've identified and you figured out some patterns for this malware and what it does or what it doesn't do, we could create rule sets that we can then use to block or detect other samples that fit this schema in the future. And so a big part of what we're going to be doing later down the line is writing Yara rules to do this kind of detection stuff, which is really, really cool. But these rules sort of encapsulate two things, but it could be more. We have network-based indicators or signatures. And then we have host-based. Network-based indicators are just things that are related to the network. Like if you figure out that this malware is beaconing towards some sort of IP address, you can figure out, first of all, you can figure out if the IP has been categorized and logged as being malicious or flagged. So you can figure out if it's related to a broader threat that's been persistent for a while, or if it's a new threat, it doesn't matter. And so you can create a network-based rule that will monitor for this IP address in case down the line you get infected again and you see, wait, this is calling back to the same domain that you know traumatized us the other day and then we have the host based indicators which are just things that change on the computer itself things like the registries new files were created or processors or things like that which we can make rules for and monitor for as well i don't think there's another field out there that better encapsulates the proclamation that in order to defeat something you have to study it you have to learn as much as you can about it you have to become it you know what i mean and malware analysis is this entire trope as a field so seriously it's it's a really really cool field. We are preparing to systematically identify, poke, and prod malware samples that we come across or retrieve 
from external sources. Because of this, it's very important that we understand some of the vocabulary and get the same lingo down so that everyone can understand what we mean. As many of you already know, malware is short for malicious software. If a certain piece of software can in any way cause harm to, steal from, or stop a device, service, or user, it can be considered malware. And there's a metric sh ton of malware out there, so we've categorized them based on what they do or what family they belong to. There's more malware than what we've created. What we've typically created is not even scratching the surface of what there is out there. Malware itself is an umbrella term that encompasses and encapsulates various different kinds of malware. For instance, you've almost certainly heard of backdoors, loaders, droppers, <laughs> we have rootkits, scareware, adware, ransomware, bioware, worms or viruses, stealers, keyloggers. But it's not always that easy to categorize or classify malware and align it to a singular group because there's a lot of malware out there that can do a bunch of these different things. I don't even know what the f I created over here. It, it's a dropper, it's a loader, it's it's an injector. I, I don't even know what the hell this is. So don't get too caught up on the specific details. Often malware is way too big and complex to understand every single detail, but you should just focus on the key features of malware and the key characteristics of it. Don't get lost in the fucking sauce. Another thing we should understand is how malware is classified by security solutions or defensive solutions like Defender, Avast, or EDRs like Sentinel-1 or whatever. Of course, not all of them classify malware in the same way. It's not uncommon to see something similar to the following classification scheme. This is how Defender does it. It's segmented in the following way. First, we have the type, the platform, family, variant, and suffixes. The type denotes what kind of malware it is. It could be anything from a backdoor to a tool used for hacking. It could be spyware, remote access, any of these. Platform is the operating system you're on. So for instance, if I try to compile Ruby as a popular AD tool for all things like Kerber roasting, Asfrep roasting, and much, much more. And Defender has a very small but very literal heart attack and says the following. You can see how classification is done. Again, certain things have their own naming conventions or taxonomy. For malware or threat actors, for instance, Defender XDR uses the following for threat actors, and it's based on the theme of weather. There's also this um, incredible post made by Karsten Hahn, you know, the person responsible for malware analysis for hedgehogs, an amazing channel, who goes into depth about malware families, just names, and this terminology and how it could be better, which I will leave a link in the description for you to go read. It is a very niche thing but there are different approaches to how this malware is handed out when it comes to the kind of malware it is like for scareware it uses a shotgun approach because it's designed to attack as many machines as possible but things like targeted malware like a specifically designed backdoor as you can imagine a shotgun approach wouldn't really fit that and so if you have been targeted by extremely specific malware it's extremely hard to protect yourself down the line if you don't analyze it you have to figure out things like what it was targeting how it even got there how it communicated with the person who sent out the malware and then you can build these little patterns for it like we've discussed and sometimes when you're analyzing malware when you've gotten these general rules built out you can catch this malware much earlier in its life cycle you know you don't let the hydra grow another head so to speak you cut it off which i'm pretty sure is like what you're not supposed to do in every single iteration of the stories but Because this is our first introduction to malware, there's just a handful of things we're currently capable of doing. Don't worry, it will get cooler and cooler as we progress, but we need to cover our basics first. Our main objectives here are to fingerprint the sample, do some static analysis on it, figure out what it calls, what strings it might have, and all of this is done to shine a light into the damp cellar that is this binary, to increase our attack surface. We're just gathering as much information about this file as we can without running it. I've touched upon static analysis and dynamic heuristic based analysis in my self deleting malware video so be sure to check that out if you want to delve deeper but for the sake of time i'll really quickly reiterate what was said in that video in order to differentiate between these two for static analysis we just want to get as much information about the file without actually ever running it we want to confirm its target architecture we want to fingerprint the malware to see if it's got a criminal record or not which again we talked about in self-deleting malware video polymorphic malware exists it could change its signature signatures by 
by themselves are not a good way to detect malware because you can change a signature so easily, which is why we use indicators and rules because signatures aren't by themselves reliable. They are amazing for cataloged malware that we've already found and that's not known to change. But for malware that's sophisticated that will change using polymorphic code or new malware that we've never seen before, the signatures are useless, which is why we want to take the step to fingerprint it first. And if it doesn't exist, we could upload it somewhere like virus total. And then we want to scan it as well with an AV just to confirm if it's malicious or not. You want to gather things like strings as well. Like uh, strings are very, very telling. They tell you a lot about a program. Think about like a program that you've made before. And if you're not a complete psychopath, you've probably had strings in it, you know, ask for input or giving status updates and so we can use that to figure out what's going on within a binary now keep in mind there are very well-known techniques to get past these strings being in your program we have things like string obfuscation we have api hashing where instead of using strings you use generated hashes for your function calls iat hooking so you know how the iat is a big dumb snitch bitch. it's great for us as analysts but it's a horrible nightmare for us as developers but it's not that hard to get around that either and sorry just a little tangent for the developers listen i know as developers we're so focused on making our malware appear as clean as possible but listen you have to understand that as an analyst if you look at the iat of a program and you see like no functions virtually there that's also suspicious as fuck too so you have to balance this you can't just make your malware looks super squeaky clean that's in itself very very suspicious it's like you walk into a goddamn room and it's it's, it's too clean you know there's way too fucking clean throw some dirt on that shit a little bit you know make it don't make it just make it appear normal that's the main goal you, uh, for malware development is to make our program look as inconspicuous as possible and as normal as possible if we're an analyst and we're examining a program and it looks normal like the other thousands of programs it's much harder for us to draw a conclusive result in the static analysis stage, I should say. When we get to dynamic analysis and the program looks fine, but a trillion PowerShell prompts open up, then yeah, you know, that's reasonably suspicious. Sorry for the tension, but yeah. The second we run it, it's not static analysis anymore. It's dynamic analysis. It's heuristics based. We're consulting the behavior of the program to help understand. It. Remember that you do this in a sandbox place. Don't just run it on your host machine. We run the malware. We identify what it does, what it doesn't do, what files it changes, what processes it potentially creates, what registries it modifies, like anything that happens on the host we want to try to figure out if it calls out during dynamic analysis as well we're going to try to keep an eye on the network because it's most likely going to be talking to some kind of endpoint that we need to be on the lookout for either for classification or just to understand if there's another step that we need to perform i know that's a little quick and dirty recap but i have made a the whole separate video about this as well which you should watch and as for the antivirus comment listen you're not going to be using one antivirus or at least you shouldn't you can throw that onto virus total you know slap that bitch on there and virus total has you know a variety of like around 70 antiviruses that you can use for analyzing the malware it's pretty decent as for these obfuscated strings and stuff, there are tools that have been designed for this purpose to deobfuscate them. Tools like Floss or FireEye Labs Obfuscated String Solver. It helps you try to find and extract these obfuscated strings, deobfuscated obviously, and you know it can help you try to figure out what dirty little secrets a program might have. This isn't included in every single resource that talks about this, but there's also a third step, which is hybrid analysis, and then you might have an optional step where it's reversing. Often times this is very time consuming because it's reverse engineering but yeah just be aware of that we will be doing that because i mean we have all the time in the world Now you might be asking, Crow, why of all the different kinds of things you can talk about malware analysis related, why are you choosing to talk about a file format? Well, first of all, how dare you? And second of all, the PE file format, aside from being literally the primary file format that Windows uses, it stores so much information inside of it that we could use, that we could scrape, that we could look out for. Getting really good at reading the PE file, the different PE sections or looking at if there's packed sections or trying to derive the IAT or the imported functions or exported functions, things like that from the PE file is a crucial step. It's a gold mine of information. We need to cover it. And because most malware is going to be in this PE format, right? Either it's going to be an EXE or a DLL or something. It's very important to understand this. And there are a bunch of different tools that we can use to analyze the PE automatically. Things like PE Bear. No shortage of tools that can do that. I like the way that OS Dev says it the best. The PE format is in fact a bastardized version of the COF format, the common object file format. There's two versions of PE. There's PE32 for 32 
32-bit and PE32 plus for 64-bit. Why they wouldn't just call it PE64 like normal oxygen breathing humans, I have no idea. A huge shout out to Hex Rick for his incredible blog post diving into the PE format. I'll leave a link to this in the description, as well as everything else discussed here, obviously. If you were to dissect an executable on Windows like a crazy person, the first thing you'd see is the presence of the following two bytes, hex 5a and hex 4d. These magic bytes are the signature of the DOS header that every PE file starts with. If a file has these bytes at the start of it, you can be certain that it's a PE file. All different kinds of file formats have their own signatures, and I'm sure many of you as pen testers have had scenarios in which file's magic byte value or format signature was misconstrued and required manual patching in order for it to be viewed or work. Same thing here. If these magic bytes get worked, Windows won't be able to run it because it won't know what the hell it is. These two bytes are hex values for MZ, which are the initials of one Mark Zbikowski, who was one of the leading developers of MS-DOS and the designer of the MS-DOS executable file format, and so it's named after him. The DOS header itself is just a 64-byte structure that has various members in it. It looks like this. We won't cover every single member, but the most important for us right now is the E magic member, which is just the start of the DOS header, again, just the magic signature of bytes, and the ELFA new member, which just points to the start of the NT header section. But before we get to the NT header section, just we still have to talk about the DOS stub, which sits between the DOS header and the NT headers. Have you ever come across this string before, where it says, this program cannot be run in DOS mode? Well, this actually comes from the DOS stub, which is this section directly after the DOS header, but stops right before the next header. The DOS stub's duty is to print out this error in case the PE is loaded in MS-DOS mode. There's also a rich header, which is optional. You might come across it, which is just a byproduct of Microsoft, basically. It, it's linker generated, so if you use any kind of Microsoft tool chain, like Visual Studio or something like that, it will have this in it, this rich header in it. After the rich header, if it's even present in the first place, we finally get to the NT header, and this is where the meat of the entire thing is. This is where we get a lot of the information. Just like the DOS header, it has its own signature. The NT signature, the PE signature, is hex 50, hex 45, and they're just hex representations of PE, uh, and there's a couple of zeros after and that's the official signature of a PE file. There's two versions for the NT header, depending on what architecture you're on. There's a 32-bit and 64-bit, and they're both just structures as well. The only thing that's different between 32-bit and the 64-bit is the last member, which is just the image optional header, and that is dependent upon the architecture that we have. Now, for the signature itself, you might be thinking it's just PE. It's not. It's a D word. And so there are, it's a four byte thing. So it's PE 0000, right? And that's the full PE in ASCII. If we look at the image file header in 64 bit, we can view the members that are in it. And there's a lot of information here. And we're not going to go through every single possible member. I will highlight some of the ones that I thought were pretty cool. The first member is machine. It will tell you the CPU type. And Microsoft has a list of all of these. And the ones that we could be interested in is hex 8664 for 64 bit or hex 14c for i386. Now the second member, the number of sections is how many sections are going to be present within the PE file. It could be very important to find this out and we'll cover sections in a little bit here, but it's really cool to know that this will tell us how many sections there are. The time date stamp is just a Unix timestamp and then we'll skip over these and go to characteristics. Characteristics tell us a lot of stuff about the file, like whether it's a executable, if it's stripped, if it's a DLL. So this could be very very useful as well. Now going back to the NT header section again, we can see that there's another reference to a header here, which is the image optional header. Now this is the most juicy part of the entire PE file, in my opinion. This is where we get the most information and the coolest. And this is where we can do a lot, a lot of stuff. You can see that this is not a small structure, it's pretty big. The first one is the magic value from the documentation. We can see that this could let us know if it's PE32 or PE32 plus image or executable. PE32 plus images allow for a 64-bit address space while limiting the image size to 2 gigabytes. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> the subsystem is pretty cool too. It tells us if this program or this executable or whatever this is, is a GUI-based image or if it's a console-based thing. The size of the code, it tells us how big 
big the dot text section is and dot text is where we have our code address of entry point is also really cool it's going to be the relative address of the entry point when this executable file is loaded into memory telling us where it's going to start from look there's a lot of stuff here guys and you can get lost for hours and hours on all of these different members we'll move on because there's another shiny thing right here which is the image data directory this data directory that we see here is just an array of these image data directory structures and looking at the constant defined here it's just 16 which means that we have a maximum of 16 of these data directories now because this is an array of structures we can actually <laughs> depending on the index that we supply or or that shows up here it denotes a different kind of data directory for instance zero would just be the export directory it will have the addresses of every single function that we've exported as well as the variables and this is important because if another program is to use our functions it needs to get these addresses so from somewhere this is how that happens you're going to find an export directory in certain files that are meant to share code with other things so we know of one file type that does this almost specifically and that's dlls they're meant to export their functions so that other files can import them and use them so you'll typically find export directories in dlls like kernel 32 which exports the Win API, or NTDLL, which exports the NT API. There's also the import directory. There's a bunch of these different things. The biggest thing that we want to look at, though, is index 12 the import address table. Again, I'm leaving a lot of things out here, but this is something that we can make an entire video on. And I want to leave something for you guys to go ahead and do. The import address table is just a bitch, you know? And the reason I say that is because the import address table is a structure within our, that's going to be in our image that contains all the information about all the functions that we've gotten from the other files. And so for example, if we import create thread from kernel 32 or open process from kernel 32, that's going to show up in our import address table. Hey, there was even a blog post post written by the amazing Raymond Chen. He specified that now the import address table is write protected. The import address table is the part of the Windows module, executable or DLL, which records the addresses of functions that we've imported from other DLLs. If your program calls get system info, then the executable or DLL will have an entry in its import table that says I want to call get system info from kernel 32. And so when the module is loaded, the system goes and finds that function, obtains its address and stores it in a table known as the import address table. And so when the module watch it needs to call that function it does so by fetching the value from the iat and calling it we can think of the import address table as a table filled with function pointers because that's exactly what it is when it needs to call a function that's been imported by our image it's going to look up that function pointer to execute it but because of this it does make it a pretty juicy piece of meat for attackers to look at because if we were able to overwrite any entry in the iat we could redirect a function to a location of our choice and so as raymond chen says here the iat is now write protected once the loader has obtained all all the function pointers it right protects the table to make it harder for an attacker to override it there are a little bit caveats but you can read this in the description now i have to move on to sections there's i mean there's so much more we could cover about the pe literally we can we can keep on talking about this but i have i have to move on the next section is going to be about sections hilariously funny a pe file right first of all we can determine how many sections there's going to be because there's a member that tells us in the nt header it tells us how many sections there are in the pe number of sections member of that structure these sections are split into different names and they either have executable data, read-only data, or just some resource information. And because, again, there's no one amount of sections, because there's so many variables that can go into altering the amount of sections present. Like, for instance, if your uh, PE is packed, packing would probably add a section or a couple. But because we have that NT header number of sections member, we will be able to find it, no problem, how many there are. But the most common ones and the most important sections that we'll see in a PE, in pretty much every single PE, is .text, .data, .rdata, .rdata, idata.relaw and dot resource. As malware developers, we've actually placed our payloads in a lot of these sections. I didn't make a video about it, but you can place your payload in dot text, dot data, dot r data, dot resource. Yeah, so dot text is the executable code. We've written a program out and the code that we wrote that's gonna be in dot text. Dot data holds variables that we've defined. So only initialized variables will go into dot data. Dot r data are, are like the variables except they're constant. So if we make a variable constant, it's gonna put it in r data because it's a constant value. It won't change it's not supposed to change so it goes into read only because you can't write to it to alter it idea is just import tables so there's the different kind of tables that we discussed on what functions are going to be used like the import address table stuff dot relock is there to shut up crow crow's dumb what he meant to say for this section is that dot relock just holds a bunch of base relocations if the loader wasn't able to load the image at its preferred address then the dot relock section is the thing that handles this little hissy fit 
Otherwise, the relocation information in this section is just ignored. And that resource is just for things like if your program uses icons or has icons or different things like that, that's where it's going to go into dot resource. But the cool thing is for any of these sections that we have, it has a respective image section header data structure as well, which also has a lot of cool information about it. Most importantly, we can get the name, right? So we have a byte array, it tells us the name of the section that it is. So we can enumerate everything that we need straight from the PE. It tells us a virtual address which is where it is in memory the virtual size which will tell us how big it is when it's in when it's loaded okay i think that's enough about the pe <laughs> so let's move on Because we're going to be dealing with malware, there's always a risk no matter how small that something unexpected can happen. Maybe you were connected to the lab environment from your host, network-wise, or maybe your clipboard was enabled or held. Maybe the malware was just advanced enough to perform a VM escape, although the last one is really, really unlikely, but it could still happen, of course. So please make sure you, you exercise extreme caution, always utilize the best practices, and always be on guard. Don't let it roll for initiative and win. I'm glad the one person who got that joke is laughing. <laughs> This is take two. I'm literally deleting the bullshit attempt. I don't even know what the hell happened. Okay, now I'm not gonna cover how to do a Windows 10 VM setup. There are gonna be things that change. Like for instance, we're gonna be changing our network adapter eventually after our setup, because we do need the internet right now for our installations. We're gonna be changing it to host only, but that's after. For Flare VM, you need to make sure you have at least two gigabytes of RAM and at least 60 gigs. So it is a beefy, beefy VM. Make sure you have that set. Now, this is my second attempt doing this because I'm like allergic to doing things right the first time. What we have to do at first, and this is important, we do have to do some setup where we disable Windows updates and the and Windows Defender. Now, luckily for us, Flare has an incredible resource. It's just a repository in which they take us through an entire guide on how to get this set up. When it comes to group policy editing, depending on what edition of Windows you install, you might not have it. And the way you can check to see if you have it or not is if you press the Windows key in R, so go into the run, or if you can do this in command prompt as well. If you type in gpedit.msc, and you get this error, then you don't have it. But luckily for us, it's very, very easy to remedy this. So what we're gonna do is come into here. What is this? I didn't even know, I don't even know what any of the, okay. Yeah, well, these are the commands. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't trying to use AI. I thought I just searched, I don't know what the, I don't even, I don't know how to navigate this. You wanna know some bullshit? You know you can't even- Sensing the impending 50 hour rant, we, the 1984 feds, have spared you from his unhinged sociopathic ramblings. You're welcome. So you wanna open up in the administrator command prompt? And we're gonna run these two commands. So the first one. Now just wait for that. Let's get the second one ready. Okay, that's done. We do this one and now we should be able to get access to this without even shutting down and resetting so this is good uh, gp edit we don't have to write the ms yep and so here we go what we have to do is disable defender so to do this we have to come down to administrative templates i'll try to make this bigger for you guys windows components and we have to come down to microsoft defender antivirus once we're in here turn off defender antivirus set that to enabled we're going to come down into real-time protection Turn off real-time protection, set that to enabled. That should be good. We also want to turn off the Windows updates, at least for the time of this installation. You could do this in the group policy editor as well, but you just want to pause. So right now we have that paused. Yeah, so that's done. Now we can continue on with our Flare install. So like this right here, we're going to come over here into a administrator PowerShell. Before anything, actually, at this point, with Defender shut off, now is a great point to create a snapshot of the machine, just so we can revert back to this. I'll just say, okay. And with that snapshot now in place, we can see we went from a fresh install to Defender being off to us being here, and now we can revert back to this. We're in an administrator shell right now. We're going to copy, and this is going to save, you can see from here, at our desktop. So let's just head over there. Okay, with that downloaded, we see it here. We're gonna unblock this file next. Right, now we have to set our execution policy. Now we're ready to install this thing. That's all we need, really, from Flare. Now we're ready to install. So, let's press enter. Uh, okay. So, Defender actually isn't disabled. So, because of that, we're gonna come down... God, I can't let this Bing install. We're gonna come into GitHub. I'll leave this linked as well. And we're going to get this script over here to properly disable Defender because that, for some reason, did not work. 
and we just run this. Cool. Okay, the script will be started again after reboot. Perfect. So let's just we do need to reboot this now, so let's do that. And then we should be set to start installing Flare. I mean you can take the risk, you don't have to do this, I guess. But personally I wouldn't risk it. Just you know, do what they say. Okay, we should be seeing it pop up again. But in the meantime, I'm going to open another PowerShell as admin thing. Alright, there holy sh <laughs> cool. Now we should be good to go. Just press enter. And if you thought a Windows install took long, oh, this is gonna, <laughs> this is really gonna test your patience. It does seem like Defender is disabled, so we're gonna delete that snapshot and make a proper one. Okay, now we have a proper snapshot where we know it's actually disabled. We did set up a snapshot as well. Thank you, Flair, for asking, sweetie. And now we should be good to go. Eventually, we will see a GUI pop up that will ask us what tools we want to install. Yeah, so what happened here was these are all the tools that we have to install. These are all the tools that are available to install. And I think my dyslexic ass mistook these, so I moved all these here and then technically none were ready to install. This, no matter what way we cut this, this is going to take a while. But because we're doing an install, might as well just get everything out of the way. So I'm just going to install everything. Just move everything over here and then we should be good. Let's press OK. Now this is going to take a long, long time, okay? I mean, your great, great grandkids are going to have PhDs before this shit's done. So yeah, I'm just going to go age by 40 years and I'll be right back. We unkindled our worthless. Can't even die right. Gives me conniptions. I genuinely don't even know how fing long that shit took. It is finally done. Okay, when we get to this point, it's done. I'm pretty sure I can close out of this now, but the first thing I want to do is take a snapshot of this because I never want to do this again in the rest of my life. Okay. All right, so now that's done. I'm pretty sure I can close this. I hope I can close it because if, okay. Yeah, so we can. Right, and we get the snazzy little, um, <laughs> I love this wallpaper, it's really cool. We can kind of come into here just to see what the point of this was, right? We have a whole suite of tools now that we can use. We even have a command and control center section. I mean, there's fucking Merlin and Covenant, right? We have a bunch of different stuff, so like debuggers, disassemblers, just everything that we could want, we have now. And now it's perfectly set up. What I'm gonna do next is Come over here. We're gonna go into the network adapter options and we're going to put this on a host only now. Right. And there we go. Now we have everything set up. Just be prepared when you're trying to install this. Of course, it won't take as long if you don't select every single tool like I did. I just figured that, you know, I'll just let this run for half my life expectancy and then just let it do its thing so that I don't have to do this again. But you definitely don't have to do that. Just install the tools that you want to use. But if you're a beginner and you don't know what to install, I mean, you know, so just be aware that it is going to take a long time. I'm not memeing. This genuinely, I started, I don't even remember what time it started with. I'll show it up on the screen now, but it's 6.26. 6 a.m. right now. Look, you can even, that's so cool. Even if you right click, you could just hash the files, compare hashes. That's really, really cool, actually. You can, and for executables, open with Ida. This is so sick. Oh, that's actually so cool. This is gonna be the extent to what we set up in this video. You have to remember that typically with malware analysis, there is usually a segmented network kind of scenario going on in which we have a Windows host that operates as our Windows malware analysis station. And then we have a Linux host, which operates as a Linux malware analysis station. But with Linux, you can have it set up so that it acts as a proxy that catches any calls that our malware on Windows that we're analyzing might make. For instance, if we have a file called not malware.exe or something like that, and we execute it during our dynamic analysis steps and somehow how it reaches out and it's trying to call a domain I don't know, Elemental Hero Yu Gi Oh Cards Collection.com. Something obviously nefarious because no normal human being would go on there. We would be able to see that from our Linux machine if we set up a tool called iNet Sim, which we will do in the next video because right now this is going to get too congested. And it's also important to know that you could have iNet Sim, that whole networking thing, to catch these calls set up on a singular machine. But I do like having a dedicated machine for it and a dedicated machine for Linux malware analysis as well. And just like Flare, there's a whole distribution dedicated for malware analysis on the the Linux side called Remnux. It's the flare equivalent to the Linux side. So we'll set that up in the next video. But for now, this is more than enough. We're not gonna do anything too crazy right now. There's a lot of cool features here. And once you set this up, I want you to go in here and look around, you know, interact with everything you can, right click and stuff, you know, like see what tools you can use. MD5 hash of Visual Studio shortcut, right? Look at that. It just gives you hash. It's so, it's a bunch of things that will save you so much time. So seriously, go ahead and just look at everything that you can. With that being said, I'm just gonna go straight into the analysis of our malware that we programmed out but before i do that i need to take a nap this this is insane 
Most of you have probably come across or interacted with malware at some point in your lives. We all remember our first traumatic ass interactions with malware. In order to analyze malware, we obviously need a sample of, well, <laughs> malware. It's very unlikely that in the beginning you'll be capturing it from a sandbox environment or a honeypot or getting it from an infected system. So instead, we look to malware hosting sites or repositories. These sites or repositories are things that can house anywhere from a couple to a metric shit ton of malware samples for you to download and examine. Real life malware, this is as real as it gets, no more training wheels. We will be extracting random samples from these eventually and making dedicated videos on them like I've said before, but because we're just starting out, we won't dive too far from known territory, so we'll be using malware that we've created and developed as our training wheels. VX Underground, Malware Bazaar, The Zoo are probably the most well known for this purpose. You can go to them, grab a sample or two, whether it's a super popular sample like Wanna Cry or something recent and not that known and you're off to analyzing. These samples will typically be archived and password protected so that during transit you don't accidentally detonate it. Most of the time the password just is just infected that's kind of the norm uh, that's sort of the shebang for your malware analysis i do really like vx underground the most because they have the largest collection of malware they also have great papers related to malware development and defenses as well and it's all free so it's a really really great site for both sides Okay, so by the time you watch this video, this repository that I have here is going to be public. It's going to be available for you to interact with. This repository is expected to grow alongside our malware analysis series that we're doing now. As of right now, all there is is a homework folder with samples that either I or a friend have coded or programmed. And they're just meant to be little fun gamified samples that can help you exercise your skills. As we start actually delving into real malware, things that, you know, were actually made for the purpose of being malicious, properly malicious, real evil shit, they're going to be put into their own directory called samples. So we'll have homework and samples. Also be aware when you get access to this, if there's samples here, exercise extreme caution. I mean, do that anyways with any of the samples that we see here. Your homework actually is to go ahead and reverse this sample. But what we're going to do right now is do a little walkthrough of it. So this is your official spoiler warning. If you want to give this a shot before I spoil it and we walk through this, pause the video, go ahead and do this, come back when you feel ready. And yeah, just take notes on what you see. Remember, you want to do static analysis, dynamic analysis. You could go in into manual reversing. If you want to, you'll have a archived folder, which is going to be archived with the name of the sample and then a password. There's going to be password protected in the password. As is the case with malware in this field, the password is the typical infected that we might see. So let's download this sample. With that downloaded, I'm going to start up Flare. There's many ways you can get your malware onto your machine and there's varying degrees of safety here. I mean, you can do SSH or whatever because it's malware that I've made. I'm willing to be a little bit reckless here. I mean, we could drag and drop it there, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do instead is make a shared folder and I'm sure there are better approaches, but again, I'm not a malware analyst. I'm learning alongside you. So bear with me. So we come over here to edit virtual machine settings. We go to options. We come to shared folders and it's going to be disabled by default. Let's put always enabled just to add in the folder, but we can change it to this. So that way it's not just lingering. So you're going to come into add and now you want to find a folder somewhere that you want to put stuff into so that your machine can access it. I have a malware directory in my virtual machine folder. So we're just going to put that there. And now anything that we put, I want to make it read only as well and enable this. Anything that we put in this folder now will be accessible to this machine. So we come here, this is the directory, and I'm just gonna paste in that archived folder. Now we're ready to boot this up. Okay, cool, we're in. I've just hidden all desktop icons because it makes me physically ill when I see them all clattered about, but we can make our way to the shared folder that we have to get our malware. So we're gonna be in our network and then VMware host. Okay, shared folder, and there it is. See, and now we can get this here. So I'm just gonna open up a new window for desktop and just make a new folder called malware and then drag and drop this in here and then i'm just going to turn off the shared thing i don't want to leave it just lingering options shared folder and yeah we'll just set it to this so that when we power it off it will be disabled from that point onwards we have this archive right so i'll start by unzipping it you could just throw this into virus photo as well flare vm comes with really cool fast utilities like submitting to virus total right away opening in virus total i think because it's so common to have our password protected with the password of infected we have a quick option to just do it automatically so let's just do that okay and then this is what we have here very cool we have our crow file <laughs> it's very funny and then we have a readme let's give this a little read before anything you know hello analyst there's no easy way to say this things have gotten maldivious some f***ing jester chucked a goddamn bird into the mainframe and the bins are all trashed. The extent of the damage. 
unknown. My marriage, in shambles. My mental health, yes. Please, pretty please, unf*** our shit and let us know what you find out. Do we need to worry or is this just a harmless prank? Please God, please, let this just be a harmless prank. Patiently awaiting your reply. Sincerely, horrified. By the way, you should totally subscribe to the good fella crow. He's so muscular and strong and tall. Alright, well, see, I don't know about you guys, but I want nothing more than to help this person out. Jeez, I feel for him. And especially that last part, which was totally true. So what we'll do here is just start by doing our basic static analysis stuff, right? We'll see if this malware has been known to be, you know, thrown about there, if it's got any history behind it. If it does have history behind it, it makes it a lot easier for us to understand what to expect, right? It's not unknown in that sense then. What I'm going to do first is just create a little note i would be doing this in obsidian or something we'll start by getting the hash and there's various utilities that we can do right away we can get the md5 i like this tool because it gives us the variety so i think the md5 and sha256 are the most common so I'll just copy this sha256 cool let's just save that now what we want to do is come down to virus total we can drag and drop this and submit this to virus total again do the functionality present here or we can copy one of these hashes and see if there's any hits that we get all right so we're on virus total it's very cool virus total will let you search for urls ip addresses domains or file hashes we're gonna do a file hash let's search to see if we've got any hits Ah, okay. So we've come to find out that this sample is a career criminal. This is um, this is someone that's addicted to crime. So yeah, it's been detected. 29 out of 69 <laughs> vendors have found it to be malicious, which is a lot. Like if you see this many, probably a good sign that it's malicious. So we do have reasonable suspicion here, right? The threat categories, we see that's a Trojan, shell code, and we see the different little naming conventions here. I'm not gonna rely too much on Virus Total because Virus Total will pretty much tell us everything that we really need to know but it is a tool that you should definitely be using details here like for instance it tells us when it was created the names right so we can see that someone probably like really strong and funny submitted this earlier so we see the names that it was submitted with and seen in the wild and so we can see if it does anything the behavior is also nice to know it tells us a lot i don't know where this came from honestly it tells us like registry keys that are opened and things that are set and stuff like that there's a bunch of things that we can dive into look this is all information that will tell us what's happening is all of it like a hundred percent um, no, as someone who's actually made this sample, I would say some of it is kind of, I wouldn't say wrong, but just, you know, you're going to need to further look into it is what I want to say. Overall, it's like a nine or eight out of 10 analysis, but I don't want to rely on virus total. The link to it would be pretty cool. All right. So we've determined that it's pretty suspicious already. And so now what we could do is look into good strings or content. We can first of all view what sections it might have, right? Let's go analyze the PE or we can, first of all, let's detect it. Let's see what information we get. So it was compiled using MSVC. It's a PA64 and it's linked by the Microsoft linker. So we know that we should be expecting at the very least that rich header. And there's a certificate added, which we can look at as well. Sometimes it's really cool to do these things. So just some information there. The file size is pretty small. We could also find out things about the entropy, which is really cool because entropy of a PE file can denote if it's been packed or not. And I'll see if I can find a really cool graphic that I saw earlier that showcases this. With that being said, let's open this up in PE Bear. Load PE. We're going to go to malware. There we go. So yeah, you can see that adding the extension does nothing. All it does is disarm it. So if we try to run it, right? Jesus Christ. All right, so starting off from the top of the thing, we start off with our dots header, which we've seen, the MZ. And if we click here, it'll highlight all the values. So we can see that it goes from zero to three F. But yeah, so this is a dots header from here to here. We need this. Then we have the DOS stub right here, which is sitting between the DOS header and the rich header. So this is looking normal. We've already dived deep. Now, if we look at the sections themselves, we'll see dot text over here. We will see read the read only data. We'll see the data, the P data, resources, and that relock. Now you might be saying, where's the I data? Like, isn't it importing any functions? Well, if we look at, actually, it might be better if I disarm this. Okay, yeah. So I did have to just um, change the, I guess that's one of the differences if by using a custom extension might mess up with the imports, but you might be asking where's the I data? So this is definitely importing functions. Like if we see over here, 32 functions from kernel 32, as well as a bunch of other things here, the C runtime and other stuff here. But kernel 32 is going to be our main thing that we're going to look at because we're familiar with these functions and it'll tell us what's trying to happen here. Now, immediately, as some of you might have picked up on, it's calling towards some pretty suspicious shit here. We have 
have virtual protect, right? Changing memory protections of allocated pages. We have virtual free, so whoever this is cares about the environment. Virtual alloc, creating a thread, waiting for a single object, closing handle, getting last error, write process memory. This is like textbook shellcode injection stuff, which we are very familiar with at this point from our malware development series. So hmm. now, does that mean for certain that just because these functions are in here, they're going to be called? No, right? Sometimes you might have functions that you import just to make it seem like something else. Like for instance, you might have a Win32 API function, which is expecting like three inputs, right? But if you set them all to, even though we never call this function, it doesn't do anything, it's going to show up here. So that's some of the ways that people pad the IAT, kind of make it look less suspicious. They kind of alter and try to balance that scale. We have some injection related APIs, which I'll just copy and paste real quick. So we have a couple of these. Now, the thing that we we kind of gain after getting a little bit of experience is figuring out what kind of injection it is based off of the functions. Because this doesn't have any of the extended functionality, like virtual alloc X, for example, or create remote thread or anything like that, most of those extended functions give you a ability to specify a remote process to do it too. For instance, virtually allocating to a remote process, first of all, you would see, you would need to get a handle somehow. So you'd most likely see an open process function here to get a handle, right? And then you need the extended virtual alloc X because the difference between the extended and the normal one is that the normal one is for the local process, whereas the extended one lets you do it to a remote process given a handle. So because most of these functions are missing that extended thing or that remote keyword, I can tell that this is going to inject in itself. It's a self-injection program. So now this is probably not the way that you're actually supposed to take notes for malware analysis. I'm sure there's a methodical approach. I'm just writing down what I find interesting and then I'll go ahead and eventually when it's time to make a report, I'll have it all properly formatted. Again, I'm learning here as well. See that this is imported from kernel 32, right? We, you're free to go ahead and investigate other functions. Like for instance, that is suspicious as well to me too. Registry get value. So you're getting the value of a registry, creating it, setting it, closing it. This is just stuff to modify registry keys. So that's also very, very uh, registry alteration no Skyrim. All right. So, you know, as detectives, we're kind of, <laughs> we're kind of piecing together the puzzle a bit. Okay. Let me format this better. I feel like looking at this is going to give people headaches because it's giving me a headache. And hey, by all means, if you can make a program that does some of this automatically, you know, automating this would be an amazing way to learn this for sure. Most of the ways that I learn like a new technique or something is by trying to automate it. Okay. Right. So that's what we have here. Now, given that this program injects in itself, and then for some reason also looks into the registry keys and then does some things with it. I think at this point, it would be nice to look at some of the strings present within the binary. That could be very, very telling as well. Right. This by itself is already a smoking gun, right? I mean, think about it. We're, we have our detective caps on. We're trying to see that this is doing something malicious, but look at what we have here. We have a bunch of malicious, typically abused API here. It's not a good sign for this. Everything, every piece of information that we get is just further cementing the fact that this is malicious. And we're getting a kind of an insight as to what it's doing. So at this point, what I'm going to do is just run strings on it first. I mean, you could run strings right away, but floss, I think will show you the same output you would have gotten with strings plus some of the other cool stuff it does. So I just default to using floss typically. Let's see what it finds out. Let's see if I can make this bigger. All right, so here's what I found. Again, it's seeing this. So maybe this is defined somewhere. We get some really cool stuff here. Things that should be glaring out to you. You know, if you if you see shit like this, it's definitely worth investigating. Things like this just lets us know that this is signed. And signed just means that there's a certificate attached with it. You, you might not see all the time because like, unless you're using a leaked certificate to make your malware look more authentic. Like if we have a leaked Microsoft certificate, it would show up with Microsoft stuff. We see all the standard stuff stuff here. Oh, and then we start getting some actual strings. Okay. So these are just ANSI escape codes. So this is directly just for color outputting this stuff. Now we see this, which is very, oh, this is a cool banner. Okay. We're getting a lot of potentially very useful and insane strings. So firstly, this looks so out of place. It looks like credentials, right? So I'm going to come over here and just save this here. We have a potential output directory. It could be input as well. Maybe it's trying to find a note here. So maybe it's just potential input output. If the program is expecting there to already be a note or something here, we might have to supply that in order for it to work as intended. So we, yeah, we can see that it's asking for a username and password. Hmm. There's a lot of stuff here. Okay. Luckily the person making this malware was, oh, and we get a huge reveal. Look, this program was made with a database file for debugging information, right? But in it, you see the path of the user who developed this, which is very, very telling and horrible for OPSEC. This by itself is pretty, pretty revealing. 
Look, we're getting a bigger and cleaner picture here. And then we have all the little sections. Look, the iData is there too. We're getting a lot of stuff here. Now let's take a look at that certification. If we go to properties, we will see in the digital signatures, a signed certificate, which we can then open up to further get information from. Well, some malware will try to make itself look legitimate by having these, what the f is happening? by having these certificates. Of course, because this isn't trusted, it will let us know that. I would say that signed malware really does better because it's not placed under as much scrutiny if you can say that your program was made by Microsoft. So we have an email, uh, Gaius at mysweetchocobo.io. So if we view the certificate, get more details. I guess this is just for immersion, but there's nothing really of note here, aside from like, if you want to lead into an investigation. So that's going to be the extent of our certificate study. Now I think it's time we actually start our dynamic stuff. So now is the point where we start trying to run it. Now we should have done this earlier, but what I'm gonna do is come over here and make a snapshot. And what I typically do is prefix the malware name with pre, and then you can add more information at the description if you'd like. Pre Ultima and take the snapshot. All right, so now we have this revertible snapshot in case like this completely molly wops our operating system we have a revertible instance right we have a backup so it's very important guys like make snapshots regular snapshots and you can also put like actual useful information instead of you know being cringe like putting the date or maybe some of the information that we found here something to pick and choose from but now that we've made that snapshot i'm going to try executing this and let's get this going because sometimes you might have malware like for instance uh if we open this up in pe bear again oh, sorry it's already open if we look into that thing that tells us what kind of application it is okay yeah so the subsystem them, right this tells us that it's a console program so sometimes a console program might spit out something and it'll be too fast and it will exit immediately so what i do is i open it within a command prompt right and make sure when you're in a command prompt remember the privileges of your command prompt right if you run a command prompt as your user this will run with your privileges unless it's doing some sort of abuse specifically designed for escalating privileges so just be aware that that running malware with admin privileges and you know your user privileges depending on what privileges you actually have can yield in different results opening up a command shell here i think it's finally time to run this thing let's count down three two one okay my laptop actually just turned off while i press enter didn't know i made now with that f***ing strong so this looks hideous like it really does <laughs> That's because the ANSI escape codes aren't set, but we see something crazy here. So we do get that in initial inkling right. It's definitely trying to... Okay, this is not self-injection. This is... Sorry about that, guys. I don't know how long it... Registry-related APIs. And this is done with an ADB API. It's attempting to read a value from this weird registry key. Virtual terminal level. Now, of course, if you don't know what this is, there's no harm in searching for it. So in Google, I search for virtual terminal level. And the first result tells us, wait, how to use ANSI color in the terminal? To use ANSI color codes in the Windows terminal requires setting virtual terminal level. Virtual terminal level 1 is now set by default for the terminal in Windows versions 15.11 to 19.03. This had to be enabled at the registry here. Huh, okay, so we can see that this is literally just trying to enable ANSI, and it says that here because our malware is so polite, it tells us everything. Um, and it seems like we're about to get lemon grabbed real quick. Enabling the ANSI support, registry created, and now if we had things that monitor registry keys, like Procmon, I'm pretty sure, is Procmon is a huge tool for this. Proc Pokemon deserves a video in its own right because it's a very, very in-depth tool. But basically, given a process, we can see what operations it does. For instance, we see Explorer opening a key to this path. And so if we filter for our process, so come over here, filter. It's a beautiful filtering system as well. It's very intuitive. For instance, if we say process name is, it's the name of this stupid process, Ultima, then include it. And see, everything goes away. But if we run this again, and I'll delete the registry key, just so it does it again. So we're to regedit. First of all, if we come over to the path of that registry key, the virtual terminal thing, we see that's set now. And what would have to happen is you'd have to close your terminal, restart it again for a color to be enabled. But if we start this again... Why? Microsoft? Look at that, we get so much output. This is a boatload of information. Look, there's a lot of things that happen here. Some of it's just not through our choice, but this definitely is. You see, it starts by opening and querying to see if this value exists or not. And of course, it found that it wasn't found. And so what it does is it will create that key and then it will set it to one. Isn't that cool? Now, because our malware will automatically close, we can try running it now again. And it's very important to be writing this down. You're gonna see a lot of malware analysis reports that have a very cool looking flow chart to them. That's what we wanna kinda of emulate. We wanna go from beginnings, the basics, into seeing what it does, the different flow paths that it might take. All right, so it will check to see if this is set to this, which we just got from the website a second ago. If it's not enabled, the process will create this key, sets it to one, and then it exits. 
So now that it's created, let's see what it does. You want to be asking these questions all the time. And okay, now that the key is there, right? It's it was looking for that initially. Now that it's there, what's going to happen now? Let's solve that mystery. Okay, much better now. So we see that color is now outputted. We get a snazzy little status logging thing. And ah, use our credentials to sign in. Okay, well we have that here. That's why taking notes is so important. We have credentials, or what we think are credentials. Oh, they're yeah, right here. So yeah, your notes it should probably look a lot better than mine. But of course, we also want to have this monitoring all these calls. And so the username, Gaius. Well, let's see what happens if we get it wrong, right? Okay, well, yeah, so... <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't mess around with this too much. Uh, let's go to what we think is credentials. And again, I know, guys, listen, some of you are so allergic to fun. It's genuinely insane, okay? I know, you're never gonna find malware out like this. That's so gamified. That's not the point. This is for training. Some of you have this incredible belief that just because something is a bit fun, it has no benefits to it. I've seen people literally criticize my content because they say that <laughs> they would rather have me monotone, talking like this, discussing whatever I'm talking about. Like, it's crazy. Guys, live a little. Have fun. This lets you learn. And this is very serious stuff, okay? Gosh. All right, so the password is glittery chocobo one, two, three. All right, so we are authenticated as a Gaius Van Bile Balzer. <laughs> Balls, uh, or the Black Wolf. If you guys don't know what this is, like, you're probably like, what the f are you talking about, Carl? It's, it's from a game. It's Final Fantasy 14. You guys play it. It's an amazing game. And so we've authenticated. If we press enter now, what's gonna happen? Oh my gosh, that's gonna happen. The power, the power of the sun. sun in the, the palm, palm of my hand. hand. That's not what he says, that's just from Spider-Man, but I really like that, it's funny. And then if we press okay, the thread finishes and the process dies? The, 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 the f Why did it die? Oh, because I, start <laughs> I started it from, um, I started it from the window here. I should have actually started it in the command shell, like I've been saying this entire time. Glittery chocobo, one, two, three. All right, there. <laughs> I was not gonna let this finish without that funny line. <laughs> Such devastation. Such devastation. This was not my intention. This was your intention. Exiting. I right, so, huh. It self-injects into making a message box. That's cool. But does it do anything else? What, what did Procmon find by doing this? Now there's probably gonna be a lot of output. These are a lot of things that happen. So what we could do is kind of look around. Buffer overflows galore. We love that. Different things happen. There's so much stuff here. And I know it's analysis paralysis, but that's why the filters are there and you will get much better at making filters as you progress with this. It will just come to you naturally. And let's update our notes now that we've figured this out a bit. Oh, I mean, we never saw what happens if we failed the authentication. We should see that as well. I would be careful. I'd actually set a, another snapshot in case of like failing authentication because some malware might see that as a threat and self delete. So let's see. Pro one, pro two, pro. Three. Ah, maximum login attempts succeeded. Access denied, we're on our way. <laughs> okay, cool. If we fail off, if we fail authentication, this happens. However, if we succeed, we can press any key to begin execution. And once we execute, we also want to write things like what we see here. And once we press OK, Okay, so we have a really nice flow of what's happening here. We know what this does now, perfectly clear what this does, but there's still one thing that we don't know about, which is this weird path here. We should investigate this. Why is this here? The easiest way is just to go to this path, see if there's anything here. Let's go to temp. Oh, there is. Huh, so that's strange. During somewhere in the execution of this payload, this file gets dropped. And at this point, I mean, we have virtually everything here. At this point, we might want to go in to do some manual reverse engineering, but it's already been an hour since I started recording. I mean, I would love to, but you know. So we've done our two critical steps. We've understood a lot about this program, so much about this program. At this point, we can start making out a report. We can start doing our manual reverse engineering. We can start doing hybrid analysis. There's so much left to do still that if you guys want to dive even deeper. But with that being said, this is going to be the actual stopping point for our analysis. I feel like this is a good point to stop it. You like numbers, I like numbers. I like putting myself into a depressive state, and you 
I mean, you're watching this video, so you probably do too. Let's talk about some numbers. It's fascinating and sobering stuff, and it really shows us how rampant malware runs around or near us. <laughs> and it's literally only getting worse. I said earlier that there's a lot of malware out there, and a lot of malware that gets picked up every single day. Now, how much exactly? A couple hundred? A couple thousand, maybe? Well, just in 2023 alone, it was said that between 450,000 or 560,000 samples are caught every day. Not every month or year, every single 24 hours over half a million samples are caught. And that's just the bastards that are actually caught. So this number has a pretty decent margin to account for when we consider the malware that isn't picked up. Sources claim that there's also over a billion malware samples out there, which is just insane. In terms of costs and damages, in 2015, the total damages due to malware was $500 billion, literally half of a trillion. In 2021, it skyrocketed to $500 billion per month, six trillion for the year. Currently, the costs are projected to grow by 15% each year, and so it's projected to go up to 10.5 trillion fucking dollars in 2025. Do you realize how much fucking money that is? It's literally not even conceivable. 10.5 trillion dollars can buy you like 175 billion copies of Baldur's Gate 3, and that's almost 22 fucking copies of Baldur's Gate 3 for everyone on Earth. Or you could buy one Offsec or Sans course if you use a 50% off coupon. <laughs> I'm kidding guys, please sponsor. And even now, with one of the most prominent ransomware groups out there, Lockbit, recently getting their sites seized by a fucking Power Ranger task force called Operation Kronos, reveals that Lockbit may have had a global impact in the region of a billion dollars. And this is one group of how many out there. You can even see in real time from this mess mesmerizing website from Kaspersky. Just how many hits there are every second. There's so many things happening, it's insane. From threats being blocked from a literal IDS to web antiviruses, it's a lot. And of course, on a serious note, I obviously do not mean to fear monger, although I think we can all agree that this is a very serious threat. I'm barely even a hacker, what do I know? The following is just my opinion. You can think differently from me, no hard feelings, but if the numbers could speak for themselves more than they already have been, I doubt hope is the intonation that they'd use. It's been getting worse. It's only gonna get worse. And you may think me a pessimistic nihilist, for which you'd be right. But I'd also urge you to consider just how easy it is, especially now, for someone relatively unskilled to just whip out something that can genuinely do some real damage if their cards are played right. And as for the threat actors and the big bad wolves, I mean literally why would they stop? Money is often at the vanguard of motivators to many. I mean, given the chance, how many of us would just up and leave our current jobs in an instant if nothing but the salary was to change? However, when you combine a powerful incentive like wealth with malice, there's no line certain people wouldn't cross. You know, the cost of integrity, empathy, and sympathy pale in comparison to an extra literal dollar in their pocket. As a company gets bigger, it brings in more money, and to a threat actor, it becomes a shinier and shinier target. To the smaller companies, a large majority of which are family owned, with a fraction of the security and resources as the big companies, why would they care? And we've seen this time and time throughout not only cybercrime, but all of human history in virtually all disciplines of study. We've seen just how much money was, is at, and will be at stake. Fundamentally, pointing fingers gets us nowhere. If people are constantly getting exploited or falling for the same tricks, then at the root of the problem lay the way we bring these problems to light. The only fix I can see for this problem with any chance of actually working is education, which is why I hold the notion of free accessibility to information at the core of my ethos. And which is also why I'll always be providing free education to everyone, because if you don't know something about it, you can't even begin to protect yourself from it. And think about it this way, how long could you last against the monsters from A Quiet Place, that movie? Without studying them, chances are not very long. But as you stay still a moment and you learn about these monsters, you understand their limitations. You find vulnerabilities of their own, which you can leverage against them. Which is how we should be approaching our understanding of malware and cybercrime and all the things that can very negatively impact us or god forbid, a loved one. And I know some people are going to say that I'm being way too dramatic about this, but I don't think I'm being dramatic enough, frankly. I mean, it's not an exaggeration when you consider the single mother of two who whose rent is now overdue or who can't get baby formula for her youngest because her banking information was just stolen. The hundreds or thousands of pictures and memories which have just been Thanos snapped out of existence on a whim, encrypted or robbed or whatever, even if it's really simple 
ransomware, many of us can probably figure out a way to undo some of, if not all, of the damages. But what the hell is she supposed to do? Go to another place to consult something or someone else that will also probably just scam her? At the end of the day, you can blame the user all you want. Sometimes it's not even the user's fault. Certain companies have completely shot the bed when it came to their security practices. Sorry, I got a little carried away. It's just, um, it's something I'm very passionate about because real life vulnerable people are getting targeted and vulnerable people typically fall for it. I don't think it would be the severe if they didn't. So awareness needs to be brought on this topic if nothing else is to be done at the very least. All right, Grandpa Crow is done rambling now or uh, as you kids say nowadays, yapping. I've left this at the end of the video because this is sort of a rant kind of my take my hot takes on this and i didn't think it was extremely vital to the actual core material we were trying to learn here so this is why i've moved it to the end but i still think it's important because i have been gifted a huge platform in which i can potentially bring light to a very serious issue and so if i don't at the very least shed light on this situation given this incredible blessing of having so many people there's no point of me even having a platform if i don't utilize it for some good or awareness so that's why I've included it. Now, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching this video. I know it's a very long one, but it's a really cool subject that I'm really excited to get into. And thank you so much to SquareX once again for sponsoring the video. They have been so incredible during this entire time dealing with my stuff, but we made it work finally. In the next video, we will continue this amazing discussion. And with that being said, thank you guys for watching. And until next time, goodbye.